On behalf of Corporate Accountability Lab and UCLA's Promise Institute for Human Rights, uh, well, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first in our two-part series examining this year's major developments in civil litigation in U.S. courts related to transnational corporate human rights abuse. Uh, my name is Charity Ryerson. I'm the Executive Director of Corporate Accountability Lab, and I will be your moderator for these two webinars. Um, the idea of this webinar series, it's designed to develop an analysis of the extent to which U.S. courts can provide victims of corporate human rights abuse with accessible and effective avenues to seek redress, particularly when the company involved in the abuse is at home or does significant business in the United States and the harm occurred outside of the United States. So this is a complex question, um, but we have with us an extraordinary panel of attorneys who represent the plaintiffs in this year's most significant cases, um, and they can help us answer these questions. Our sessions today is gonna to focus on the Alien Tort Statute, which is a 1789 law that for this type of case used to be considered the best game in town within the United States and arguably globally until a 2013 Supreme Court decision severely limited its application. Now, a decade later, after many of us have turned away from the Alien Tort Statute as a viable strategy, we have two important decisions this year that suggest that the Alien Tort Statute is not, in fact, dead. Um, so these cases are Al Shamari v. Kaki and Doe v. Cisco, which we will discuss today. Uh, we'll also briefly discuss some claims under the Torture Victim Protection Act against individual corporate officers and under what circumstances litigants might prefer the ATS or the TVPA for a torture claim. Next week, we're going to look beyond the ATS, and we'll focus on a couple of different cases. First, a case that was litigated under the trafficking statute. This case is Ratha v. Fatana Seafood. Um, and then we'll also look at another case in which there was a major settlement in a, it's a longstanding case um, under foreign law, Doe v. Exxon. By the end of the series, my hope is that our audience is going to have a sense of what opportunities exist in the United States for victims seeking justice um, and where the U.S. is still failing to provide access to remedy to these victims. So before I introduce our speakers, a quick logistical note, uh, we'll reserve about 10 minutes at the end for questions. Feel free to use the chat for discussion during the panel, but if you have a question, uh, post it in the Q&A. We'll get to as many questions as we can, but we're only going to have about 10 minutes, so we'll do what we can. Uh, we'll also be posting links in the chat throughout the panel that'll give a little bit more context and background about these cases. Feel free to drop your name and where you're logging in from in the chat as we're talking. Um, and then finally, we are recording this webinar. So everyone who signed up will receive an email after the fact with a link to the recording um, sometime in the next few days. There will, these recordings will also be available on the Corporate Accountability Lab events page. Um, so with that, I wanna give a very brief intro of each of our panelists, um, but their lengthy and very impressive bios will be posted in the chat. Um, if you follow this type of litigation, their names and cases may already be familiar to you. Uh, panelists, if you want to go ahead and turn on your video, but stay muted, I would appreciate that. So briefly, and in no particular order, um, our panelists are Agnieszka Friesman. She's a partner at Cohen, Milstein, Sellers, and Toll, where she's also the chair of their human rights practice. Uh, she's counsel on both the Exxon and Rotha cases that we'll be discussing in this two-part series. Katie Gallagher is a senior staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights, and she is counsel in the Al Shamari case, which is one of the two we will discuss today. Paul Hoffman is a partner with Sean Brun, De Simone, Seplo, Harris, and Hoffman. Paul has argued for the plaintiffs in most of the alien tort statute cases that have gone before the Supreme Court, including Sosa, Kiobel, and Nestle. Um, he's also counsel on three of the four cases that we're discussing, Cisco, Exxon, and Ratha. Uh, Terry Marsh is the executive director and founder of the Human Rights Law Foundation. Um, she is counsel in the Cisco case that we will discuss today, and she also filed that case many years ago. Uh, and finally, Kathy Sweetser is the deputy director of UCLA's Promise Institute for Human Rights, who is co-sponsoring this event, and the director of the UCLA Human Rights Litigation Clinic. She is also counsel on three of our four cases, uh, Ratha, Exxon, and Cisco. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this discussion. I think we have an extraordinary set of panelists. I couldn't really hope for a better group. If this group can't figure it out, no one can. Um, so let's jump in and start talking about Al Shamari v. Khaki. So um, for many of the cases that we're going to talk about, and honestly, a lot of the cases related to overseas human rights abuses, we're often talking about abuses that are hidden in factories or farms around the world. Um, and we first find out about the facts of the case when the case is filed. But this first case we're discussing does not fit into that category. 
Um, in Alshamari v. Khaki, this is about the sort of widely publicized and shocking torture that took place at Abu Ghraib, a U.S. military prison in Iraq. I don't know about the rest of you, but I remember exactly where I was when I first saw the photos of the extraordinary abuse of these prisoners. Um, this was also a moment when the use of private military contractors, who were essentially mercenaries, really entered into the public consciousness, which raised some important questions about the moral legitimacy of the U.S. government and its war in Iraq. So, Katie, I want to have you lay out the facts of this case. Uh, when was this case filed? Who are your plaintiffs? And tell us a little bit about your claims. Well, thank you, Charity, and thank you to everyone for organizing this. And um, it's good to be with you all at a, a moment when I think the issue of corporate accountability and certainly human rights writ large globally is, is really in the forefront of our, our minds. So thank you. Um, so El Shamari v. Khaki, interestingly, was not the first case that we filed on behalf of Abu Ghraib torture survivors. The first case um, was Salah v. Titan. And hearing your intro, the very first plaintiff who came to us was before the photos came out. And um, so the origins of this, this, this series of cases actually was at a moment when everything was still very much hidden away and a person who was released from Abu Ghraib made it to the US before the photos in the spring of 2003 and was telling people about what happened and they all couldn't believe it. Um, you know, at that moment, it, it's hard to go back in time, but we didn't have any Guantanamo detainees who were out. We didn't know about the CIA black sites. And certainly those are different in, in kind and place than what happened in Iraq. But it, going back to the origins of these cases, it was a different moment in time. Um, we have, this is the third of the series of cases. The first one, Salah v. Titan, was dismissed already back in 2009. Uh, second case, El Qureshi v. L3, was settled in uh, 2010 or 2011 on behalf of 71 torture survivors. And this case, El Shamari v. Khaki, was filed in May 2008. And just to kind of put ourselves in a context, that was less than four years after the Sosa decision. It was pre Kiobel, pre Nestle, pre Nabisco, pre Jesner. Um, it was a, a different world somewhat. And that's, I think, part of what we're going to be talking about today, how, how much what the law is now. There are pieces that are still very, very similar to when we filed in 2008. These cases were filed under the alien tort statute by at initially four men, four Iraqis who had been released from Abu Ghraib, one of whom was a Al Jazeera journalist who was picked up and detained because he was a journalist, Salah Ali Jali. Um, over the course of these 17 years of litigation, we now represent three clients, Salah, Suhail, and Assad. Two of them are still in Iraq. They were subjected to acts that are torture um, while detained at Abu Ghraib. And at that moment in Abu Ghraib, there were private military contractors hired by the United States to assist in the interrogations. And that included people working as interrogators from the private military contractor CACI, C-A-C-I, and interpreters, um, L3. They were in other cases. So this is just related to the khaki contractors who were working with the US military in Abu Ghraib conducting um, interrogation services. And briefly, the, the theory of, of our case has been that these contractors in a conspiracy to torture and aiding and abetting torture worked with the um, the private with the military police and the military interrogators, some of whom are those people that we saw in the notorious photos. Thanks, Katie, for that that background. Um, I think you know the very long, long history of this case, where it's gone up and down on appeal. It's but there's been a challenge on every possible basis under the sun that's allowed it to drag on for 17 years. Um, unfortunately, is not particularly uncommon in alien tort statute cases. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the um, extraterritoriality issue and what this means for ATS litigation. But first, can you just, what is the impact of how long this case has dragged on on the plaintiffs? 
And just in this type of litigation, I know this isn't the only ATS case that you have brought, um, but what do you think that this is typical, this is always going to be the case, and how does this impact real access to remedy? Yeah, no, it's been challenging. Um, as I mentioned, two of our clients are in Iraq and, and the third is now um, with asylum in a third country. And just to kind of step back, I think it's incredible that these men who are survivors of torture in a US run detention center at a moment of US occupation in Iraq turn to US courts. I think that that is worth kind of noting and remarking on. Um, and that they trusted US lawyers and frankly still have trust after 17 years that they will receive some measure of justice through the US legal system. Um, you know, I, I I think there are many people out there who have doubts about the the uh, U.S. legal system at this point, but it speaks to them and their understanding or their hope of what is possible um, here in U.S. courts. But it is challenging to explain the process to them. Um, part of why it's taken 17 years is, as you said, we've had almost every defense under the sun come up and then come up again. Um, so whether it's political question or uh, government contractor defenses or immunities, law of war immunities, um, derivative sovereign immunity, whether these contractors should have some immunity that the U.S. may have, and the district court judge, frankly, ruled that the United States shouldn't have immunity even when we're talking about something like a use Kogan's violation of torture. Um, and then the whole backdrop of, of case law around the ATS and what that has meant for corporate liability, what that has meant when the torture occurs overseas, but with a US company that was going back and forth. So there are a lot of, um, a lot of defenses that have not only been ruled on by the district court, we've been to the court of appeals five times in substantive ways. We've also had a cert petition filed. Um, and just last week, we had another effort by Khaki to go to the Fourth Circuit through a writ of mandamus denied. Um, so to explain that to our clients, it is part on the, on the legal, but we have, they now understand a lot more about the legal system than maybe even some lawyers. Um, because it's, it, it is important that they know what's happening. Um, but key moments in the case, I think for them, even more than the briefing, they know that they, they now know that they have to wait sometimes two years before a decision comes out. And that even when we have a win, that there may be another challenge. So, you know, they've started to kind of um, guard themselves a little bit. But then there are moments like their depositions where they have had a very active role and while there's a lot of stress and tension, and of course, going back and talking about trauma of being at Abu Ghraib is very difficult. They, these are also moments where there is some sense of, of achievement and agency that they have been able to play a role in their, in their case. So we now have a trial date set for the spring in, in 2024 and to have them have their day in court is, you know, will be very gratifying. That's great. And I, I really, I hope for them that they finally, after all of this delay, do get their day in court. Um, one of the reasons that we thought that this case was such an important one to feature is because when people talk about alien tort statute litigation, everyone says, well, but the presumption against, extraterritor ex against ex extraterritorial application of federal statutes applies to the alien tort statute since the Kiobel decision. How is any case going to overcome the Kiobel test? There's a So this case somehow now um, seems to be one of the few that's made it through. So I'd like to hear a little bit from you about the court's decision on this. There's a really interesting discussion in this opinion about whether the Kiobel touch and concern test is dead, um, which is what the defendants argued, and that it was replaced by Nestle's focus test. Um, I don't, you know, that doesn't seem to be where the court falls. So why don't you explain to us what the court's decision was on what the current test is around extraterritorial application of the alien tort statute, and if you agree with that decision. Sure. Um, so the court has had to rule individually on Kiobel, on Jesner, um, and, and now most recently on, on Nestle. And I think maybe to kind of pull it back and, and, and look at this as a, a continuum, it's important to remember that all of these extraterritoriality decisions really go back to Morrison, 
a decision in, in 2010. So when Kiobel came out with its touch and concern test, it was against a backdrop of US courts and certainly the Supreme Court um, having a, a heightened gatekeeping role for which cases came into US courts and trying to look and say, should this be here or should this be somewhere else? Um, and we've also seen other courts open around the world. So in some ways, you know, it might have had to have been the United States or nowhere. And through developments in, in Europe, especially also in Africa and certain in places in Latin America, there maybe are other options. But for the Supreme Court in, in 2010 with, with Morrison and then with Kiobel, really it's about, is this the appropriate place? And so whether you're looking at touch and concern in Kiobel, where the Supreme Court was saying, does this case have sufficient links to the US for it to be, to be in a US court? Or you're looking at the most recent um, case, Nestle, which also goes back to the 2010 uh, Morrison case. Really what these decisions are saying is whether you call it focus or whether you call it touch and concern, is there a sufficient domestic connection and relevant conduct to put this case in a US court? And so I would say it's not that there's one test or another. I, the touch and concern test was also concerned with what's the purpose of the ATS? That what, if you're saying it concerns the United States, it's because there is a 1789 statute that opens US court doors to non-US citizens to assert a violation of the law of nations, to have a right to remedy for the most serious harms recognized by the international community. And I think that is a, a continuum that has come through in, in, in Judge Brinkema's decision from July 2023, where I wouldn't say she's reconciling Kiobel and Nestle, but she's explaining the relationship, which again, whether it's Nestle or, or, or whether it is Morrison or Nabisco, two other non-ATS extraterritoriality um, cases, these are all really asking, is there enough here? Are there sufficient connections to have this case in the US courtroom? And in our case, what the judge looked at was the nature of the violation being torture. She looked at the fact that it's a US company um, but she also, and, and critically, looked at what is the conduct that actually happened in the United States. I said that this is a case of conspiracy and aiding and abetting. So she looked at the ways that corporate um, officers and the corporation itself was engaging in conduct in the United States. So the supervision, the monitoring, the trips back and forth to Iraq, the fact that the contract was signed in the United States, all of these pieces show that there was relevant domestic conduct um, in addition to those interests of having a remedy vis-a-vis uh, -vis a U.S. corporation. Great. That's really helpful. I want to get our second case on the table, which also incredibly is passing the Kiobel slash Nestle test, whatever it may be. And then once maybe at the end of, of the session, we have time to discuss as a full panel, we can try to articulate what we think the current um, extraterritoriality test is under the Alien Tort Statute, see if we have consensus on that. So Terry, I want to turn to you. Um, Terry, you know, you filed this case against Cisco um, many years ago, though not as many years ago as the Al Shamari case. Um, when I read this opinion from the Ninth Circuit, it really kind of knocked my socks off, both because of how careful and thorough this judge's reasoning was, but also just because of the facts of this case. So can you introduce us to this case? Give us a synopsis of the key facts here so that our audience understands what the allegations are. And you're muted. You can unmute, Terry. Sorry, I just unmuted. Yeah, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I will be brief, but obviously I can't share all the facts. Um, so the case was brought on behalf of 13 plaintiffs, all of whom practice Falun Gong, which um, it's a spiritual practice, which um, several courts have found um, meets meets the, the, the requirements of a religion in every circuit in the United States. And it is being treated as a religion. And all of them were subjected to 
identification, roundups, and various kinds of torture and extrajudicial killing as a result of the apparatus, which is the Golden Shield. Um, and especially there's a Falun Gong module as part of the Golden Shield, which is used specifically against Falun Gong to identify them, round them up, and forcibly convert them, which I'll, I'll explain in a minute. It's part of a, um, a history, it's part of Chinese history, the Communist Party's history that about every 10 years they launch what's called the Dojen campaign, which is a, a purge campaign where they identify a target. Their target is um, <clears throat> demonized, isolated, rounded up, detained, and forced to confess to crimes they didn't commit. Um, and that's a big part of our case, that these people who did absolutely nothing wrong, in fact, they practice their religion as people do around the world, um, and, and they are forced to confess that that's a crime, and most do confess, I, I would add. You know, I mean, I suppose I would too after, you know, a year of torture. Um, the plaintiffs just asked me, because they, they're aware of this panel, to add that um, the Communist Party operates as a terrorist organization under U.S. law and has strong ties with Hamas and the Taliban. But but that's those are not part of the facts of the case. Um, so unlike earlier campaigns, the this campaign went high tech. And um, the reason why you know why China or the party had to um, use high tech um, technology to suppress Falun Gong is, is too complicated to go into here, but they did. And because of that, they needed help. They needed help from Western technology companies because at the time they were very naive and had no idea to put how to put something like this together. So they reached out to Western technology companies and Cisco was among those companies, but not the only one. And they were all competing for the bid. And Cisco won because Cisco promised to help the Chinese Communist Party violently suppressed Falun Gong. Um, the Cisco slides make very clear that the purpose of, of what's going on in China is to violently suppress actually Falun Gong and other hostile elements. And um, Chandler, who was vice president and general counsel at the time, admitted knowledge of that and tried to excuse it simply by saying, well, yeah, that was their goal you know, implying, well, all we do is help. Um, and so Cisco got the contract and um, created an abundant number of designs which we downloaded from the Chinese internet or received from whistleblowers, um, which are, as I said, mind blowing. I mean, with pictures connecting the databases to police security, to, sorry, to police hospitals, to psychiatric hospitals, to prisons and blah, 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 you know, and so on and so forth, giving security access to very sensitive information about the plaintiffs and other believers um, that enabled them, one, to elicit the forced conversion. For example, we know your father's on dialysis and if you don't sign this, he's gonna be dead. Um, and also to prolong the torture because they had a lot of information and if people didn't cough up a confession, the torture continued. And of course, many, many were killed. Um, and this also was used against Tibetan Buddhists and Uyghurs um, and there were modules for them, although I didn't know that when we started the case. So, um, you know, China is out there among, you know, some, some other bad players. Um, the plaintiffs were all harmed through the apparatus in various ways, which we go into in the complaint. Um, and I don't know if you want me to describe the domestic conduct, the facts, you know, some of those, because the, the so the panel found, and, you know, of course I agree, that the designs were solely made um, by Cisco and San Jose, and that's clear. And the designs are the brain of the operation. Um, so even if they did nothing more, I would say that we we met the we met the we met the focus test. Um, but in addition to that, 
Cisco has an ATS X, not ATS, never mind, but it has an expert technology team um, that micromanaged the implementation, well, micromanaged the designs in San Jose, but also micromanaged the implementation both in San Jose and with boots on the ground in China. So Cisco was micromanaging not only the designs, but the implementation. All of the customer support was handled by San Jose. Um, and so if somebody calls up and says, well, you know, I can't, I can't find this fellow competitioner. This isn't working or that isn't working. I mean, they, they were supported um, through San Jose and um, some of the manufacturing. And of course, if we get to discovery, we might, we might learn a lot more. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. I don't know how, I think I'll fit within the time. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. That was very helpful. Um, I, you know, I think part of what really surprised me about these facts is just thinking about these people sitting in these offices in San Jose making decisions that were obviously going to result in this outcome because it wasn't just neutral technology decisions. They knew exactly what they were doing it for, and they put it in their PowerPoint presentations. Right. I mean, it was really striking, um, just from a kind of banality of evil perspective. Really? Really? <laughs> yeah. It was kind of, I thought that was sort of incredible. So thank you for that summary of the facts. Sure. Maybe I can go over to Paul here. I do want to come back to the extraterritoriality question because these two cases that have both survived the Kiobel Nestle test are very different. They're factually very different when many other cases have not survived it. So I want to come back to that. But first, that's not the only thing that this opinion deals with. So Paul, you argued this before the Ninth Circuit, I believe. Um, this opinion deals with a lot of different issues that are very commonly litigated in alien tort statute cases um, and has a lot of really good rulings. I wonder if you could quickly highlight some of those holdings. Sure, I'd be happy to, um, especially happy to after getting this decision, uh, which is very well reasoned and, and thorough and actually applies international law, which is the striking thing that I find in it because so many of the decisions have found sort of extra international law reasons for restricting the scope of the alien tort statute. Well, let me go through them fairly quickly. Um, in, in the Nestle case, the, the Trump solicitor general asked the court to find that there was no such thing as aiding and abetting liability under the alien tort statute, which would wipe out almost all of these cases. Um, the Supreme Court did not take them up on that. Um, but Cisco raised that issue in front of the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit rejected that in, in keeping with all of the other circuits that have decided it. But beyond that, what they did is they they went through the elements of aiding and abetting, the mens rea and the actus reus, in a way that's um, extremely favorable to plaintiffs um, in the sense that it applies international law. For The Ninth Circuit finally has decided that Cisco only needed to have knowledge of the human rights violations. They didn't have to intend them. They didn't have to have a purpose for facilitating them. They, they had to know about them when they went in, uh, which resolves a fight that's been going on in the Ninth Circuit and elsewhere for decades. Um, in, in addition to that, the, the, the way that the court analyzed the substantial assistance prong of, of uh, Actus Reis, what they had to do, um, was also in keeping with international law, that there weren't, it didn't have to be a violation of international law, what they did. They just had to take substantial actions to facilitate the human rights violations, which is exactly what they did. Um, on corporate liability, which um, what the Ninth Circuit did was recognize that at this point, there are five justices of the Supreme Court that have found that corporations can be sued under the Alien Tort Statute, which includes Justices Gorsuch and Alito, um, which I think is the only time that Alito has ever voted for anything that I thought was a good thing. Um, and, uh, and so they've found that there is corporate liability. Um, one other thing that's not maybe not as obvious is that um, in Sosa, there was a second step in Sosa that the Supreme Court and Jessner used to exclude foreign corporations from the ambit of the alien tort statute. The, Cisco basically was pushing this court to say, because we're are alleging that the Chinese government and, and, and Communist Party violated people's rights, 
that that inherently was political and should lead the court to dismiss the case under the second step in Sosa. And this opinion rejects that kind of analysis and, and rejects the argument that you should ask the State Department for permission to go forward or wait for China to object. Um, it basically says, look, there are, there are human rights claims here. We don't see any reason for them not to go forward within the Sosa analysis, which I think is very favorable uh, to us. And as I said, they, they rejected some of the restrictions that other courts have put on the alien tort statute. And the one that comes to mind the most is the Second Circuit and Fourth Circuit using the Rome statute um, to, to have an elevated standard for mens rea and aiding and abetting. And the court went through the analysis, said why the Rome statute didn't apply and why it was going to apply customary international law um, faithfully. Uh, which I think all of which is is incredibly um, helpful to plaintiffs. Um, and I think the final point I make is the one I first made, which is unlike some decisions, this is an incredibly thorough, well-reasoned, well-supported decision. It will be hard to challenge it on the merits of the arguments. That doesn't mean they won't be challenged, but but that's a good starting point. For us. I mean, it's about as well-reasoned and well-argued as you could imagine a judge that's not one of us doing. Yeah, I'd certainly, Paul and Terry, you should frame this decision, <laughs> hang it on your wall for the rest of time. Um, t Paul or Terry, do you feel like the Cisco court's interpretation of the extraterritoriality standard mirrors what the Eastern District of Virginia did in Al Shamari? Um, and why do you think that the court found sufficient domestic conduct to overcome the presumption? Oops, you're muted, Terry. Uh, Terry, you're muted. Okay, so I would just say briefly that the, the court did not rely on all the factors in Al Shamari, and I don't know that those factors were actually set forth as the factors in any in any event. Um and they might have been there might have been a little bit of overlap, but um those those factors were not treated as um having precedential value um for our court. I don't know that we would have met all of them in any event. You know, the if I could just add to that a second, I mean I think what, what the court decided was that the focus of the statute was a violation of international law on on US territory. And again, in Nestle, the Solicitor General and Nestle um, and Cargill argued that the focus should be seen as where the injuries took place, which would of course be in China uh, and would wipe out all these cases. And what the, this court did is, it, and I think it's really important is to say, if there's a violation of international law, if you've aided and abetted sufficient, you know, the, the conduct sufficiently on US territory, um, that's all you need. And that that the focus of the statute was to to go after international law violations, at least on 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 our domestic territory. Great. Um, I want to get the TVPA on the table here. So there's also torture statute claims in this case. Um, you know, I think everybody, all of all the panelists, at some point have probably litigated both ATS and TVPA cases. Uh, I think for our audience, just to make sure that folks understand the difference, if if a person is a survivor of torture and they want to bring a claim in the United States under the alien tort statute versus under the, the torture statute, um, there's different considerations for why they might do each. There's a really interesting piece in this case that I think highlights this. This isn't new, and I think it's consistent with past jurisprudence on these on these cases, but where the there's claims in the Cisco case against individual corporate officers. Um, they couldn't bring claims under the torture statute against uh, the corporation itself because the torture statute was limited in 2012 to only apply to individuals or natural persons. Uh, so they brought these claims against individuals um, under both the ATS and the TVPA. Um, and the court found insufficient domestic conduct to support a torture claim under the ATS, but it was sufficient to move forward um, under an, an aiding and abetting claim under the TVPA. 
Can you give us a sense of, of why the these claims work under the TVPA and not under the ATS? And whether or not from a policy standpoint, does this um, does this make sense? Do torture victims have a sort of coherent um, legal landscape that they're moving into when they want to bring a claim in the United States? Paul, you want to do that? Or you want me to? Sure, I, I can do it. I and mean, the answer, the first part of the answer is pretty simple. The, the, the Torture Victim Protection Act is expressly extraterritorial and the alien tort statute right. is the function of the, the courts interpreting a very general 1789 statute that they found the presumption against extraterritoriality applies to. And the court or courts generally in the Supreme Court have a lot more um, uh, ability to restrict the alien tort statute because it's not an express cause of action. In fact, the Torture Victim Protection Act was passed in the early 1990s because of the controversy about the ATS and to make sure that there was a statutory cause of action. Um, the thing that's more problematic in this context and one that we're fighting in the Chiquita case is um, whether the individual officers are acting under the color of foreign law. And there's a negative decision on that in the Chiquita case that's going up to the 11th Circuit on appeal. And I suspect that that's going to be where most of the argument is going to be over suing corporate officials um, for human mm. rights violations under the alien torts that under the TVPA. Mm. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, you know, let me zoom out to some questions for the group. I think it's important for folks to be able to comment not just on their own cases, but on each other's cases. So maybe Agnieszka and Kathy, I'm particularly interested in your thoughts on these questions. Um, maybe just going back to extraterritoriality and the alien tort statute, and based on these two cases, plus, you know, the rest of the jurisprudence on this, are there any conclusions that we can draw about the types of cases that still have a chance under the alien tort statute? I know Agnieszka or Kathy, do you want to take a stab? I mean, I can say I think that these cases highlight the need for um, a comprehensive investigation before starting. I mean, I think what Terry did in the Cisco case is really phenomenal in, um, you know, getting all the documents that were relevant and making sure that um, there really was a very solid foundation for all of the claims and where the conduct occurred. Um, I think that as these cases, as we continue to bring these cases, um, you know, it's really important for lawyers to use tools like digital investigation and other tools that they can use um, to get these documents. It can be really difficult with corporations um, hiding their, and covering up their actions. And usually once you actually get into discovery, you can find emails of how can we cover up all these actions. So um, it's just really important in, to, to start with that investigation the way that Terry did. Yeah, that's great. I think that was one thing when you read the, I, everyone should read this opinion for a lot of different reasons, but when you read this opinion, this evidence that they have really jumps out and you just think, wow, how did they get this evidence? And I realize that some of it, for whatever reason, was like publicly available on the Chinese internet, which is extraordinary, but they also have these whistleblowers that Terry mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many cases where you just can't get enough information about what was happening in the corporate headquarters in the United States and, you know, what what ideas people were formulating or actions they were taking because it's within the custody and control of the defendants. And then it's just a question of can you get it through discovery? So I think that's a good um, evidentiary challenge. I don't know, Agnieszka, do you want to speak either to this evidentiary issue or this broader question about the future of the ATS? I think... One thing that is weird is corporations act through their agents. So the ATS really just should always be available when it's a U.S. company. And I just think it's a little weird that it should matter whether the Cisco officer was in San Jose doing the aiding and abetting or whether they flew and were like at a layover in Singapore doing the aiding and abetting or whether they landed in Beijing and were doing the aiding and abetting. Like that isn't, that doesn't seem like that should be the jurisdictional fact that really matters. It doesn't seem like it should. <laughs> I agree with you. Um, so do we feel like the test now is clearly articulated? I think that the Al Shamari court says that it's a blend that sort of the 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 Nestle test does not change the Kiobel test, even though the Kiobel test used this touch and concern language, which we then don't see that exact language reflected in Nestle. Um, I don't know, Paul, do you want to speak to that a little bit more? Like if you could articulate what is the ATS extraterritoriality test, what would you say? I have no idea. 
<laughs> I mean, I, I, th I mean, I think the Supreme Court and Nestle purposefully left it open. I mean, they re they were asked to to make clear guidance about what they meant by either touch and concern or focus. They were asked to say that touch and concern no longer applied. They're asked a lot of things, and all they did in Nestle was say, well, on these facts, this is general corporate oversight and it doesn't work. And they let and they punted on every other issue, right? So I see Al Shamari as as being kind of the quintessential touch and concern, you know, you aggregate the relationship to the United States kind of test. And I don't think that's what Cisco applied at all. Cisco said, well, okay, there's a focus test. We got to figure out what the focus is. The focus is uh, an international law violation on, on domestic soil and, and in a way that, you know, at least some cases will meet. Um, I think the Second Circuit in, I forget the name of the case now, um, adopted a similar position actually um, on, on um, focus. And so, you know, I think at some point the Supreme Court or, you know, either they'll leave it the way it is or the Supreme Court will have to make a decision. And hopefully they would make a decision that, you know, the Cisco test, it seems to me, works pretty well. Although I take Katie's point that, you know, it really is about relationship, right? I mean, where Kiobel, the reason Kiobel went the way it did, I think, was that there was no relationship to the United States. And that's that's why it missed the touch and concern test. Um, that there really wasn't any connection at all, except for an investor office in New York City, you know, that was you know had a hundred thousand dollars worth of of, of, of uh, spend expenditure every year, and that you know that that's a problem. But Al Shamari is a whole different ball game, right? And Cisco is a whole different ball game. And a lot of these cases where we're trying to hold U.S. corporations accountable or a whole different ballgame. They're U.S. corporations imposing their will and human rights violations on people around the world, and they should be held accountable. It seems like Paul has given us a very well-reasoned, I don't know. I like that. Kate, do <laughs> you want to jump in here? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in to clarify one thing. Um, the El Shamari factors that maybe people are talking about are the five factors in the decision post Kiobel. Um, and I forget what year that was. Was it 2014? 2014, the Fourth Circuit ruled. And then we have Judge Brinkema's decision from July where she doesn't say, oh, touch and concern is, is, is gone, but she does apply Nestle and she finds a focus and says, we've always been looking at the focus and, and the explicit mm -hmm. focus that she finds for the ATS it must be conduct constituting the alleged violation of the law of nations. Oh. And so what she does with that is she does the Cisco analysis, mm -hmm. but she does it also broader. And by looking at what is the focus of the ATS, she actually looks to two Supreme Court decisions, Western Gecko and, and I think Arbitron, if I'm remembering off the top of my head, the correct name, um, which say you have to look at what is the object and purpose of the statute. And when you look at the object and purpose of the, the ATS going back to 1789, it was to provide a remedy in U.S. courts for foreigners, especially when the perpetrator was a U.S. citizen. Um, so she does define a, a, a focus and she does then look to see whether that violation of, of the law of nations has US-based conduct and that's relevant to the focus of the ATS. And you know, when we're looking at aiding and abetting and conspiracy, aiding and abetting has to be connected to the claim. So I think just like it's odd to look in 2023 and say, wait, were they at a stopover in Singapore or is Katie doing this Zoom from, I don't know, a beach in Mexico? It, it's it's you, it's not realistic and it's there's not really an underlying purpose in some ways to say where were where was the phone call um where was some of the conduct where was some of the instruction given but likewise to separate aiding and abetting from the tort you can't have liability if you have a tort but no aiding and abetting or no conspiracy Th these are all 
the mode of liability is connected in with the commission, the actual commission of a tort. So whether in Cisco you have your rating and abetting that was all in the United States or a lot of it was in the United States, um, I, I, I'm not really sure that there are as many differences as we think, even when some of the judges may use sharper language to kind of cut off uh, where you can where you can look. I could add one one thing to that. Just um, you know, the focus test is about territoriality, and if you find that the focus of the statute occurred here, as Cisco did, the conduct is actually territorial. It's that it's not extraterritorial at all. And the factors are talking about the substantial connection, the you know cases that make them like a territorial case, but the conduct might have taken place somewhere else. So I think there's a question about the Philardega case, which I think Justice Kennedy was really trying to preserve, which is the case when someone's committing these egregious violations and seeking safe harbor here. And Justice Breyer's dissent in Kiobel was all about how do we prevent people from just taking a safe harbor here when they might be the only violator. Maybe they just go fly somewhere else, they torture or kill someone, and then they fly back here is really what we're saying that there's no jurisdiction over them. And I don't think that that specific question is closed yet. So that's that's something that we really have to keep in mind also. Great, thanks, Kathy. Agnieszka, did you wanna jump in on this question? I have one more, you don't wanna jump in, okay. I have one more question for this group and then we're gonna to switch to audience questions. So if you all have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will get to them. Um, my last question, going back to this TVPRA issue, you know, if the presumption against extraterritoriality doesn't apply to the TVPRA, then I think there's a good reason just to avoid this question about what is the test anyway. Um, I think that there's a good reason why people might want to use the TVPRA in lieu of the ATS if you have if torture is the the claim that you have. Um, but because of this lack of corporate liability, you're not going to bring it against the company. It would be officers. Uh, are there challenges to bringing a case against a corporate officer as opposed to to the company itself? Are there reasons why that might be more difficult because of the lack of corporate liability for this potential torture survivor um, looking forward? I'm going to post that. I'm sorry, did I say TVPRA? I meant TVPA. Just for clarification, TV, I'm using TVPA as the torture statute, TVPRA as the trafficking statute. Um, right now I'm talking about the torture statute. Agnieszka, do you want to jump in? It makes it a lot harder. It's a lot harder to get information in advance. It's a lot harder to get jurisdiction over the individuals. It's harder to figure out who they are, what they did, they turn over. And it's sort of a fiction because in most cases I've seen the company immunizes the executives anyway. So it's just kind of a fiction that makes it harder to bring the case when the company is responsible in immunizing the participants and Congress really ought to fix the statute and make it workable. And they ought to fix it by making corporations liable. Yeah, it does seem There may like also be trial considerations, too. Sorry, Paul, it's, go ahead. I was just saying there may also be considerations about the trial the trial that you might have. It, it may be more difficult to assess liability for certain things against individual corporate executives when it's really the corporation that's responsible, and some jurors might think that's unfair. And then you don't have the corporation in front of them. Yeah, could you... Um... I think I understand what you're saying. Maybe for the audience, could you spell out a little bit more why that might be more difficult? Well, I mean, if if the reason you're bringing the suit under the TVPA is that the only people you can sue are the individuals, um, and you have to get jurisdiction over those individuals, and you have to show what they did to make you know for the responsibility for the underlying claims. Like for example, in in the Chiquita case, you're talking about thousands of people that were murdered by by right-wing death squads supported by, you know, by Chiquita. That is the allegation in the case. But the case on, under the TVPA is against certain corporate executives, and they played more limited roles. They weren't there the whole time. They might have, you know, they may not have as direct a responsibility for making the payments to the right-wing death squads. It's a much more difficult challenge, and you could imagine a defense lawyer getting up in front of a jury and saying, Oh, wait a second, you know, my my client didn't cause the deaths of 8,000 people. I mean, he signed a, a, you know, maybe he signed this check, but he was told to sign it by the CEO who's now dead or, or, or you know, you couldn't get service over them. So it's just a more complicated um, 
it's a more complicated thing. And the only reason you would be doing it is that you can't sue the corporation and the TVPA. But, and that goes back to Anyeshka's point, which is that the corporation should be sued rather than the individuals, because it's the corporation that's really the driving force for the kinds of violations that we've been challenging in these cases over the years. Thanks, Paul. I think that's a, a clear call. If anyone here is uh, from the Hill, we'd like you to amend the TVPA <laughs> to give us back corporate liability. Um, I've got a question in the Q&A. Um, so I think the question here is, um, so Paul, when you were talking about sources of international law um, and the court sort of pulling in international law or not, which I know some courts um, are less amenable to using international law, are there certain sources of international law that pass muster under the Alien Tort Statute, um, especially when customary international law might be usable? I'm getting different pieces of this question. Um, are there other sources that are not considered adequate uh, to consider? Well, I think what the Cisco analysis was an attempt to apply customary international law in the truest sense, you know, using all the different sources that are available, go back to the Nuremberg tribunals, to the, 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 the International Court for Yugoslavia, Rwanda, um, other international tribunals, um, treaties, you know, in other words, take a, do an actual customary international law analysis to find out what are the rules that are accepted um, in the international community and applied in these contexts? And I think what, what's so noteworthy about Cisco is how careful the analysis is in terms of actually applying the tools by which customary international law is ascertained and applying them you know, properly rather than going off and saying, well, you know, this might be customary international law, but the Rome statute looks like it might be worse for plaintiffs or more restrictive. Let's play, let's use that, which is what the Fourth Circuit said in Aziz, right? And so I think that that's, it's the traditional sources of customary international law in the way that they're applied by international tribunals and, and, and by governments when they, they try to ascertain what the rules of the road are. Great. Does anyone else have any experience or thoughts on using international law in these cases in U.S. courts? Do you find that courts vary in terms of how open they are to it? Have you seen courts being increasingly open over time or not so much? I think Cisco is an example of where of where how far we've come. That you know when when this enterprise when when we were litigating this after Florida, you know, over forty years ago. Um, I think a lot of courts thought that they didn't know what customary international law was. They didn't know why it applied. They were resistant to applying it. They thought it was something foreign and not part of our domestic experience. Um, and I think you now have a lot of cases, even when we don't get everything we want, where the courts are taking international law much more seriously and trying to apply it. They don't always get it right, but... Um, at least they know that it's relevant and applicable. And the Cisco decision shows, you know, this is what a this is what it looks like when a court gets it right. Great, thanks, Paul. Katie, did you want to jump in on this? I've got a couple more questions that I'll put on the oh, table after. This. Okay, uh, just very very briefly on this, I think it also depends on what the violation is. When we're talking about things like torture, the fact that we have so much litigation in the immigration sphere where you're talking about well-founded um, fears of persecution and torture is there. I think we we sometimes need to step out of our very narrow boxes of what we're thinking is human rights or international law practice and look more broadly and, and help to make those connections for judges. Um, and that's part of our, our own practice of international law domestically is something that we should name and lift up, whether it's in, in areas of forced labor. Where do some of those norms come from when, when we have practices? You can look to the ILO. So I think it's, it's a little bit the work that we have to do. And I think there are certainly times when we've seen things codified in domestic law or where aiding and abetting, frankly, under international law is the same as aiding and abetting under Halberstrom. And pointing that out, it can, it can help to demystify 
while at the same time having opportunities like what we see in Cisco, where judges really do um, in, in a very deep and, and proper analysis of customary international law. But I think some of the work is on us to demystify and make those connections. Great, thanks, Katie. Um, I'm gonna grab two of the questions from the chat. I'm gonna throw them both out and um, I'll let anybody respond to either of these uh, before we close up. So one of them, uh, which I think these are somewhat related. Any thoughts on why Cisco dis on the, why the Cisco decision was so well reasoned? Was it briefed particularly well? Um, was it helpful amicus briefs? Did the judge happen to have better knowledge or training on international human rights law? I think that's a great question. Uh, the other question I'm going to throw out is um, in preparing these cases, particularly aiding and abetting cases, the knowledge of the corporations and individual defendants about the international law violations seems particularly important. Without having full discovery access, what do you think are some of the most valuable evidentiary sources to demonstrate that knowledge? So I'm just going to do these two questions. I apologize to the rest of you with questions that I can't answer. Um, and I will put this out to the group um, to tackle one or both. I could do the first one except for the briefing question because I'm not going to talk about how good the briefing was. But I, I do think that the, we did have very important amicus support in the in the circuit, and I think that's very important in these cases um, in terms of giving the courts uh, reliable outside expertise that they can rely on in coming to their decisions. So that's important. I, I think in terms of you know, Judge Berzon. Is, is well known as a particularly thoughtful, intelligent judge who has written a lot of very good opinions in many different areas. And I think she took this on as a big project for her. And it took a long time for the opinion to come out. We argued it twice over the course of six years. So they had plenty of time to think about it. And I think um, she must have thought it was very important um, to write the kind of opinion that she did. And I think she knows that there's a split in the Ninth Circuit over these questions. And I think she was writing it um, to address a lot of those questions in advance. Great, thanks, Paul. Um, does anybody want to tackle the second question about evidence of knowledge um, of the corporation in an aiding and abetting case when you're pre-discovery, how you get that information before you've gone through discovery? Kathy, go ahead. Um, well, I could say one really valuable source if you're looking into a corporation can be their shareholder documents and 10K filings. It's something that we always look at. And um, especially if there's shareholder activism going on, there could often be queries being posed by shareholders at meetings that would be relevant to what you're asking about. Um, obviously, it depends, right, like how well known the problem is um, and whether or not the shareholders even know what's going on. But I'm thinking of some of the immigration detention cases, for example, I know there were groups of Jesuit shareholders that asked a lot of really insightful questions about use of force in the companies and how they're treating detainees. And so that kind of thing can be really helpful um, and it's definitely something to look for. Great, thanks, Kathy. Um, I think that there's so much more to say here and there are so many really good questions in the Q&A now that we're not gonna get to. Although these questions can also be posed in our next session. So I think this is a good transition. Um, the, please join us next Wednesday on November 15th at noon for the second part for this two-part series. We will start that session with a few kind of key takeaways from this week's conversation. So if you feel like we covered a lot of ground here, it was very technical, hopefully this will help distill our thoughts a little bit into something that's digestible for everyone. Um, next week, we're going to focus on Agnieszka and Kathy's cases, talking to us about developments in the Ratha and Exxon cases. Um, and the full panel, like today, will chat about what these cases taken together say about the legal landscape um, in the U.S. as of late 2023 for these kinds of cases. Uh, and as a final note, if you enjoyed this discussion, you want to be more involved, Corporate Accountability Lab is hiring for two positions, which we're posting in the chat. Um, the deadline is in two days, so if you're going to apply, do it. Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you so much to our extraordinary panelists. Thank you for this conversation. And we're really excited to continue the conversation next week. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Katie, Terry, Paul, Kathy.